Good morning, sixth grade. Today's Tuesday, second day of our week, um, and we are going to get started right away. We're not going to have a devotion today because I'm kind of tying my devotion into language today. So, um, so we're going to wait on that. But let's go ahead before we begin our day and have prayer time. I'd like for you to pray aloud with me there in your home. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, I love you, Jesus. I thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. I thank you, dear Jesus, for the good things that you send, Lord, and I'm trying to learn my best to thank you for the, the things that are not so good, Lord, because they strengthen us. They help us to grow spiritually, Lord. Help me to be thankful for all things in my life. Lord, I thank you for each of my sixth grade students. Lord, I thank you for Carly today and Ariana. Lord, I thank you, dear Jesus, for Dylan. I thank you, oh God, for Matthew today. I thank you, Lord, for Lucas. Jesus, I thank you for Hunter. I thank you for Addison, dear Lord, and I thank you for Brianna. God, I thank you for all of my sixth grade students. I am missing them so very much, and I ask that today you will just be with them and guide them. Lord, I pray, dear God, that they can feel your presence in their home today. I pray that they can feel your presence in this time of distance learning, in this time of quarantine. Lord, I thank you that you are with us at all times. Help us to do our very best today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. We are going to go straight into math. I hope you have a wonderful Tuesday, a terrific Tuesday. Whenever I say terrific, I always think of Tigger on Winnie the Pooh. I don't know if any of you watch that, but I used to watch it by the hour with Avery Matthew. So, all right, um, we're going to be heading into math. So get your math books ready and I will see you there. Before we start on our math worksheet today, which I do want to review with you, um, let's go ahead and do a couple speedy Sam's, see how you do at home. Once I say equal, shout out the answer and see if you're correct. 24 divided by 6 times 3 plus 11 plus 7 times 5 minus 10 plus 10 minus 8 equals hoping I'm hearing lots of voices shouting out the number six if you said six you are correct and I'm throwing you a virtual piece of candy all right here we go here's another one 10 plus 10 divided by 5 times 9 minus 6 divided by 5 times 12 divided by 9 times 8 minus 16 divided by 4 equals let me hear your answers. And if you got the answer 12, then you are correct. Let's do one more and then I'm gonna do a super fast one for all of my whizzes. 11 times five plus three minus seven. Ooh. Divided by 17. Give you a second on that plus seven times 10 divided by 25. They're throwing some big numbers at you. Plus six equals. And the answer is, drum roll, 10. If you got 10, you are correct. And here's one last one. Five plus two minus two plus six minus three plus 10 divided by two minus one plus two minus three equals. That was a fast one. If you are correct, then your answer will be seven, 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 seven. Very good. All right, we are moving on to um, your worksheet. It doesn't have a page number at the bottom. Did I type a page number on your syllabus? 
Um, I did. It says worksheet page 97 on your syllabus, but it starts with finding the missing radius. That's the worksheet I'm going to work on in math. So go ahead and get that one out. Some of you might have worked ahead and already done this. I just want to go through this with you really quickly. Um, see if uh, there might be some trouble spots to help you out a little bit to give you some reminders. And again, you're welcome to use your book and go back and look up anything that will help you. First part is finding the missing dimensions. They're giving you your radius in A and B, and then you have to find your diameter in C. I'm sorry, and then they're giving you your diameter in C and D. Um, let's just do a little quick review. If your radius in A and B is four, then your diameter is going to be double that. That's your diameter. And I'm not going to give you any more hints other than that. Also, you will need to show your formula to find your circumference. You have two formulas to find circumference. You have formula for circumference using your radius and circumference using your diameter. You can use either one of those. They're not telling you which one, so which one ever, whichever one you like best, use that one. I prefer the one with diameter, but it's up to you. On diameter, it gets a little bit trickier, but not much. This time they're telling us our whole diameter is three inches. So what is half of that of our radius is what you want to know. And then you find your circumference again using your formula and show me your work, show me your formula. I'm gonna say again, show me your work. Very important in sixth grade that you do that. Let's go on down to find the answers. You're adding, subtracting decimals. Make sure your decimal is in your answer or your answer will not be correct without your decimal. On C, you are adding fractions. Again, you need to find a common denominator. I'm trying to find how much of my board shows up. Let's erase this. If you need a refresher on finding common denominators, you can list the denominators that they've given you and then list your multiples of both of those numbers. Four times one is four, four times two is eight, four times three is 12, four times four is 16, and so on. Six times two is 12, and so on. Eight times two is 16, eight times three is 24, and list them until you can bubble a match. And then you wanna find your new numerators and add. Now, if your fraction after you add is improper, you're going to have to fix all that. There's gonna be several steps to this. On D, you are subtracting fractions. Again, you can make a list to find your common denominator. On E, you need to put your fractions into improper fractions before you can multiply. And F, we have a little secret on that one. What is it? Keep, change, flip. Make sure you do that on F. On G, H, I, and J, two-step problems to this. You're going to want to. Ch you're going to want to change your percent to a what first? I hope I'm hearing decimal. Change your of sign to a what? I hope I'm hearing multiplication, and then you will multiply. However, 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 on I. First, you're going to change your fraction to a decimal and then move it. So on I, you might be filling in some, some dips there with something, so that's a little hint on I. Moving on to the next page, I can get them apart. Find your areas, use the correct unit of measure in your answer. Now. Big hint here, you're looking for your area. Your formula should start with A equals, but your unit or your label needs to have a little special number in there to show me that you are talking about area. Don't forget that in your answer. So you're finding the area of a triangle, square, parallelogram, and rectangle. Don't forget a little trick with finding your area of a triangle. We want to look for that even number to have to take one half of that. 
and we know that 24 is our even number, so that's gonna be the easiest number to work with. Again, I need to see your formula, and I need to see your unit or your label in your answer. Draw these circles on A and B. Now, um, remember we wanna open our compass up to our radius, not to our diameter. Three-fourths of an inch is, of course, going to be less than one inch, but you have to look at the correct measurement on your compass. If it helps you to look at a ruler and open the legs of your compass to that on a ruler, remember you can do that as well. And on your diameter, on B, don't open your compass to three centimeters. Your circle will be way too big. You need to open your compass to the radius of that. So what is the radius going to be on a circle that has a diameter of three centimeters? That's an extra step for you to figure out right there. All right, that is your worksheet for today. So go ahead and pause me if you want to and get that worksheet done. Again, look back in your book if you have any questions. We will be moving into language next. Go ahead and get out your language book, please. Yesterday you did a worksheet in language that finished up pronouns. We fin completely finished the whole unit. We will be going back to it a little more at the end of the year, but for now we're moving on to the, our next part of speech. We've, talk, we've learned about nouns, verbs, pronouns, Today we're gonna to move into adjectives. And adjectives are my very favorite part of speech because they add description. I, I'm crazy about description. The more description you give me as a student about something, the more that I love your work. Let me, um, we have paint splotches in the back. So um, this is kind of, a, when I think of adjectives, I think of details like fun paint splotches. An artist uses a masterpiece and it creates it with color. A musician turns sound into art, but a writer uses words. And that can result in something that is just as artistic as a painting or as a song or a piece of music. As you know, exact nouns, exact verbs, they're kind of like the primary colors of our writing. They're the kind of the primary colors of our word picture. Maybe like the reds and the blues and the yellows of our word picture to give us um, facts. But adjectives give us more of the fun things of what we're writing about. So we're going to add detail with adjectives, which will also add interest to what we're writing or saying. So that's what we're moving on to. I'm on page 188 in your language book if you want to open up there. Adjectives words that paint a masterpiece. I'm at the blue box, so follow along with me, please. An adjective is a word that modifies a noun or a pronoun. So they are modifiers. Everybody say the word modifier, because you're going to be hearing that often. It answers the questions. Which one, what kind, how many, how much, or whose? Let's say those again, say them with me. Which one, what kind, how many, how much, or whose? Adjectives answer these questions about the nouns that you're talking about in your writing. An adjective makes the meaning of a noun or pronoun more specific by providing you with more information. Here's a few examples. That film, which one? That one, you're answering that question. Teacher's desk, whose desk? Teachers, again, you're answering that question with your adjective. Adequate time, how much time do I have on this test? You have adequate time. Adequate is your adjective, it is answering how much. Five donuts. Addison ate five donuts, how many? I'm using Addison because we know that she probably would never do that. <laughs> How many donuts? Five. Contented students. What kind of students? Contented, stu contented students. I love having contented students. That means you know what you're doing and that's what makes me happy. Most adjectives come before your noun. Most of them. So they're a little easy. They're pretty easy to find because they answer our questions. Which one? What kind? How many? How much? Or whose? And they come before your nouns. 
They modify as in the examples above. However, in some sentences, adjectives come after linking verbs and actually modify your subject. So remember at the beginning of language this year, I said that we're gonna have to be detectives, get out our magnifying glass and search and hunt for a lot of this. This is kind of one of those instances. Our neighbor's lawn is beautiful. Now, our adjective here is following our linking verb, but it is describing what? A noun of lawn. What kind of lawn is it? It's beautiful. Next one. John always appears confident. Confident is our adjective, but it's not right before our noun. It is after our linking verb of appears. So that's another place an adjective can be found is after your linking verb. Several adjectives may modify the same word. So we have to get our magnifying glass out again because there might be more than one adjective in the sentence. There most likely is going to be more than one. The big black cat was unafraid. Our noun is cat. So what is describing cat? It's a big cat, it's a black cat, and it's an unafraid cat. So we have two of them in front of our noun and we have one of them behind our linking verb. So go on a search for all of your adjectives. Ask yourself, what's describing my noun here? Next one, the cowboy, thirsty and tired, rode into town. This time we have them in a positive after our noun. Again, they're not before our noun this time, they are after. What kind of cowboy? He was a thirsty and a tired cowboy. Now, the little words a, an, and the, or the, are always adjectives. Ding, 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 that's an easy one. They're always adjectives, they always will be. Um, anytime, I'm gonna say it again. Anytime you see a, an, or the in a sentence, it's going to be a what? Let me hear it, it's going to be an adjective. They are called articles. Do not confuse A-N with A-N-D. Two totally different words there. A-N-D is a what? Everybody knows that. It's a conjunction. It is not an adjective. A-N is our adjective. Again, what is A, N, and the? Yes, they are adjectives, but what are they called? They are called articles. That's just the three of them, so it's kind of easy to remember. Let's go down to look closely. A proper adjective is a word formed by a proper noun. And like a proper noun, begins with a capital letter. Easy peasy. We all know that proper nouns have a capital letter. Um, McDonald's is a proper noun. Latresa is a proper noun. Uh, Sister Johnson is a proper noun. Disney World, proper noun. Xbox, proper noun. Now, we can change our adjectives to be, or we can change our nouns to be descriptive words, but yet they are still proper. For example, America, proper noun, but American cars, what kind of car was it? It was an American car. So even though it's an adjective, because it's a proper noun, we're going to capitalize it as a proper adjective. Rome, proper noun. What, whose government was it? It was the Roman government, capitalizing Roman. Shakespeare, Shakespeare Shakespearean drama, capitalizing that. Paul, whose friend was it? It was Paul's friend. Well, Paul is an adjective describing friend and it will still be capitalized. That's easy, I'm not too worried about that for you um, at all. So I'm double checking the syllabus just for a moment. Let's go ahead and do Think A. We're doing Think A together in our book. Uh, you do not have to turn that in on notebook paper. Doing it together in our book. Hope everybody's hearing that. Number, number one, let's read the directions first. Change each of the proper nouns to a proper adjective. Other than the possessive forms, make sure each answer begins with a what? Capital letter. Number one, France. How could we make that a descriptive word? Let's see. I ate pastries from France. So what kind of pastries are you going to eat? French 
pastries. So we're changing France to French, but we're going to keep it capitalized. So the only thing you're putting on the line there is French. Victoria, if I'm describing something that's in the age of Queen Victoria, it used to be a very popular decorating to um, decorating tool to decorate this way. Oh, I wish I could get your feedback on this, but the answer is Victorian. Let me spell that one for you. V-I-C-T-O-R-I-A-N. And of course, you're going to put a what at the beginning? A capital V. Scripture. This one might be a little bit tricky for you. Um, trying to think of an example of how I can use it. If um, Brother Carpenter asked Brother Erickson to look him up a scripture to reference something, he would call it a scriptural reference. Because scripture is a proper noun, the word scriptural is what you're going to write on your blank. That will also be capitalized. England. I think this one's pretty easy. If you're going to drink tea from England, you're going to drink what kind of tea? English tea and Hunter could have said that in a very proper English accent for us. Um, China, anything from China is going to be what? Capital C on Chinese. And the last one, Hawaii. If you have a lei from Hawaii around your neck, some of them are very beautiful, the ones that are real, it's going to be called a Hawa a Hawaiian lei. Hawaiian, let me spell that for you. Actually, it's just a capital H. You spell Hawaii and add A-N at the end. So proper adjectives also get a capital letter. I don't want to spend any more time on that. I want you to get out a blank piece of paper. This is your homework assignment for today in language. It is not on your syllabus, so I'm hoping that you're watching your YouTube video. This, um, I just need your name at the top and put language along with it in today's date, which is April, oh mercy, 14th. Yes, <laughs> um, today's Tuesday for you. Um, so this is April 14th. I want to tell you a story and it's about me. Um, it's a true, very true story. And as you're listening to the story, I want you to write down any words that you hear that you think could be adjectives. Let's review adjectives. Adjectives paint a masterpiece. They give detail to your story or to your writing and they answer the questions. Um, which one, what kind, how many, how much, and whose. So, don't be listening so hard that you're um, just listening for adjectives and not getting the gist of my story that I'm telling, um, but see if you can hear any adjectives. Okay, telling the story, it was 25 years ago, and so I might not be very smooth in the storytelling because it's not written down, but it is a true story. It is about me. It's 25 years ago, so I was about the age, oh goodness, 21-ish, 22-ish, something like that. And um, it was in January. It was a very cold day in January. I was already teaching at that time. I, was, I had graduated from college. I lived in Aurora, Illinois, which is right outside of Chicago. And it was a very cold day in January, about the third week of January. We had heard on the news that morning before I left my parents house. I was not married at this time. Um, I was engaged but we had heard on the news that it was going to be a terrible, there was going to be a terrible winter storm that day. I have used some adjectives so far so make sure you're looking for those. Terrible winter storm. It was going to be windy and blustery and um, there's something that happens in Illinois called whiteouts when it snows so hard and the wind is blowing so hard that it blows the snow. Instead of the snow coming down, it blows it across where everything's just a whiteout and you can't see anything because it's snowing so hard and it's blowing so hard. And the weatherman um, advised that we were going to have whiteouts. So my mom and my dad both said, why don't you let your dad drive you into work today so he can come back and pick you up? I lived about 40 minutes from the place that I taught. 
And I said, no, I'm gonna be fine. I'm an adult, you know, I can do this. I've driven in snow before, you know, being Miss Independent. And so I wouldn't let them. So I went to school that day. I was teaching my students. I taught um, four and five year olds at the time and um, they were all cuties. I still remember them and they're, they're like grown up now, which shocks me. But anyways, um, so I was teaching all day and I had one little student, he was one of my, he was one of my cuties. His name was Dominique. And um, we were all sitting around a table and they were working on a craft and I was sitting there with them. And he said, Sister, Pre or he didn't call me Sister Preston. I wasn't Sister Preston, I'm sorry. He said, Miss Latresa, he said, who is that outside? And he was pointing to the window. And so I looked out the window and it was already really snowing. Um, the snow was coming down, the weather forecast was correct. And I said, I don't see anyone standing out there. And he said, there's a man outside the window. And I said, I'm sorry, Dominique, but I don't see anyone. And so a few minutes later, he said, Miss Latresa, that man is still there. What is he doing? I said, I don't know, Dominique. I don't see anyone out there. And you know how little children have amazing imaginations. So that's just kind of what I left it at. And he said it a third time. Miss Latresa, there's a man out there. What is he doing? I said, well, I don't know, Dominique. I don't see him. You tell me what he's doing. And he said, oh, he's just standing there watching us, just watching us. And we went on to our next section of playtime, and I kind of forgot about that. But every few minutes, I would see him go peek out the window and then turn and walk away. So later that day, I received a phone call, and my, um, my boss, my supervisor, came into my classroom and said, you have a phone call from your parents. And so she stayed in with my class while I went out to take that phone call, and it was my mom again, and she was saying, Please let your dad come get you. The weather is getting so bad. Just leave your car there. He'll come get you. We'll go back and get your car. I didn't want to leave my car there for one thing. And I said again, Mom, I'm going to be just fine. I can do this. I'm getting married in one month and moving to Tennessee. I'm grown. I can do this. I will be just fine. And so she said, okay, but I'd rather your dad come get you. And then she said, but I'm gonna be praying for you because I'm worried about this weather. So the end of my day came and I went out to my car and um, the snow had come down so much that it was like literally piled on my car. So I was having to clean the snow off of my car. I have a special brush in my trunk that would do that and warm my car up for a few minutes for the engine to get hot and I loved my car. My dad had just bought me a brand new car for a wedding present. It was January and I was getting married in February. It was this awesome little sports car and it was a turquoise teal color, which most cars aren't today, but you have to think this was the early 19, or this was midway through the 1990s, so it was very popular in the 90s. And it was the year 1995. And um, it was a, a turquoise teal color. It was little and it had a hot pink wave down the side. And I thought that it was just the coolest thing ever. But it was a little tiny car. And um, so I was gonna be taking it to Tennessee in one month when I got married. And so as I, I was brushing it off, I was thinking how much I love my car, you know, and my mind's going here, my mind's going there. I get in my car and I start driving and I'm thinking, ooh, these roads really are pretty bad. And I had to get on a interstate to get to my house because I lived pretty far out from the suburb of Aurora. And um, so I'm driving down the interstate. As I'm driving, I'm constantly thinking about my upcoming wedding. Um, it was always on my mind. I was excited about it. I was making millions of plans in my mind. And I can even remember today that I was thinking about the ceremony. I was thinking about the colors that I would be using in my ceremony. I was thinking about where all of my bridesmaid was, bridesmaids were gonna stand, where the boys that walked them down the aisle, how all of that was going to work. And all of that's in my mind and I was thinking so hard and the snow is coming down. I'm starting to have a whiteout. The wind is blowing. 
Um, I can feel the chill inside of my car, even though my heat is on. The wind is blowing so hard that the chill is still coming in my car and it's cold, but yet I'm so, I'm so thinking about my wedding. I'm thinking about how I'm going to be able to see my new husband who lived in Tennessee every day of my life instead of living in Tennessee and me living in Illinois. All that's going through my mind. All of a sudden, my little turquoise car that I loved started to slide. The road was like ice. It, uh, the road was ice. My car started to slide and my dad had always told me what to do when your car starts to slide. But you know what? All of that went out of my mind. I couldn't even think what to do. But my car started to slide. It was sliding sideways down the highway and suddenly, I heard this horrific sound. I'll never forget the sound. Um, it, was, it was a thunk, but yet it was the loudest thunk that you could imagine. And my car had crashed into an 18-wheeler truck. You all know what an 18-wheeler truck is. It's a large truck and it has the 18 wheels underneath and all that. Um, they carry groceries and things from city to city but my little bitty tiny sports car had slid underneath that and the truck was dragging me down the highway and i could not think of what to do the only thing i could think was to call on the name of jesus and i was gripping my cold steering wheel as tight as i could in my hands and i started saying in jesus name in jesus name in jesus name in jesus name and I, I started to speak his name, my car. In my mind, it's all in slow motion, although it all happened very quickly. But as I started to speak the name of Jesus, my car went further up under the truck and the hood, the top of my car started to smash down from the weight of the truck. And I watched as my, the top of my car came down, my, my rear view mirror came down so far down that it actually touched the top of my steering wheel and i just continued to speak the name of jesus in jesus name in jesus name and as i did that my windshield i i heard the crack of my windshield it completely shattered it didn't come out but it completely shattered however i also heard the deafening crack of my windows at the side and they did completely shatter I just kept saying, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, as I went further under that truck and the top of the car came down closer to my head and closer to my hair. And of course, I'm thinking, you know, my head is going to get smashed. But suddenly, I felt myself being pushed underneath from underneath that truck and I went across two lanes of the highway and I'm spinning and I'm spinning and I found myself in the middle of the ditch between the two lanes of the interstate. And I stopped and I thought, I'm okay, I'm okay. And my first thought was, how do I get out of this car? My car was so smashed all around me, I couldn't figure out how to get out. But I just opened the door, I opened my smashed door and, and got out miraculously. And I had this man that ran over to my car and he starts saying, are you okay, are you okay? And I'm kind of stunned and dazed and I said, yes, I'm okay. And he said, I, you are a miracle. He said, I was expecting to walk over here and to find a dead body. And I see you standing on the side of the road. And all the, several people had stopped. The, by this time, the 18 wheeler was able to stop and they were running over and they were um, begging me to call an ambulance. But I kept saying, I'm okay, I don't need an ambulance. And I can remember feeling the cold wind because we were all standing out. And finally this man said, I'm gonna call an ambulance. I really think you need one. And I said, I'm fine. Someone called my mom. My mom came to pick me up. And of course, when I saw my mom, I started crying and she started crying and um, it was just an emotional time. And I turned around and looked at my little blue crushed car and then I started crying worse. But, <laughs> but, um, but all that time I kept thinking, I'm not hurt. I was so amazed that I was not hurt because I really did think that I was dying. And the only thing that was wrong with me is that I had 
bit my lip when I first hit the truck and it had bled a, li a little tiny bit. But when I started to try to get my things out of the car, uh, there was so much glass broken in my car. I, I tried to get my purse out and my purse was full of glass. I had glass in my hair. I had glass inside my clothing, but not one cut on me, not one bruise, nothing from this accident. And so later that night, I called Clark, um, who you all know is my husband to be, told him about the accident and he was thanking the Lord that I was okay. I was thanking the Lord. And um, my dad had my brand new little tiny sports car that was destroyed towed to a, um, to a place that they thought could fix it. And of course they said, there's no fixing this car. But there was an insurance adjuster that took a look at my car and he said, I understand everything on the car, the problems with it, the, where it's crushed, where she went under the car. He said, but there is one dent in the back of the car. He said, it looks like someone literally pushed her car out from underneath that truck and it left a big dent. He said, but there's no way that dent would be there from how she hit, the, how she ran underneath the truck. And when um, my dad told me they can't figure out that, it looks like someone pushed you out and actually dented the car in from the force of their push, my mind immediately went back to when Dominique kept saying, Sister Preston, who is that? Or Sister Miss Latresa, who is that man? He just keeps watching us. And I thought to myself, I know who Dominique saw. He saw either in my opinion he either saw an angel or the presence of the lord that was there watching over me protecting me and i believe that whoever dominique saw actually pushed my car that day out from underneath that truck i fully believe that and i fully believe that when we call on the name of jesus power and presence is automatically with us but so that's my story and here's what i want to talk to you about with that story i could have just said to you the month before i got married i was in a really bad car wreck but i was fine i my car was smashed but i was just fine basically that's what i told you in that story i had a car wreck but i was fine but I gave you so many details to that story. I tried to paint a masterpiece to that story. Wasn't it more interesting that I told it in that form with all of those details of the colors of my car, of the way my wedding was gonna be set up, of the way that the, um, the weather was so bad with the snow and the wind and the road being icy. All of those adjectives gave us details to make things more exciting. So I could have said the month before I was married, I was in a wreck, but I was okay. Basically, I would have told you the same thing, but I made it more interesting with adjectives. That's where I'm going to leave you today. We're going to talk more about adjectives tomorrow and, um, Make sure you turn in that sheet and you might not have found very many adjectives and that's fine. I just wanted you to see um, that details are so important to our writing and I love to add details. So I will see you tomorrow in language. Our next class for today is going to be reading. So get your reading books ready and I will meet you in reading. All right, we are in Of America 2 for reading. And on your syllabus today, it says to read pages 80 and 81 aloud to a family member. So I'm not going to read those with you because I do want you to read them aloud to someone. I want you to make sure and pause at the end where your punctuation is at. If you have a question mark, raise your voice. Speak nice and clearly, um, especially on our poem, Early Summer Thought. Um, let your words kind of flow. Let there be a little bit of a rhythm to um, your wording. And um, I, I am, yesterday I posted some of your quarantine poems on Facebook, getting a lot of comments on those. I really enjoyed those. You wrote those the first week of distance learning. So um, we are gonna, so that's what I want you to do for reading today. Read those aloud to a family member. Do your best reading for them. Impress them with your reading skills. 
And we are going to move on to history in the same exact time frame. According to your syllabus today, you have a worksheet, which is 45 through 47. And I wanna go over that a little bit with you, um, just the directions and things. Part one, let me open up to my page here. Part one on page 45 is short answer. If you followed along with your reading uh, with me, we should have highlighted most all of these. There might be a couple that we missed, but um, short answer you are filling in um, for part one. Part two is multiple choice. You're welcome to use your book and look these answers up to get the very best grade possible. This is over chapter 12, so look over chapter 12. Part two carries on to the back. Part three is true and false. Do not forget, if it is false, you must find the correct answer and put the correct answer. Part um, four on matching is what I wanna talk to you about today before I let you work on your own. Um, there might be some of these that you don't, don't use. I know you do not use A. You do not use J. So A and J you're not using. So cross those out just so that um, won't confuse you any with those two. All right, so you are welcome to finish that up. Make sure this gets put in your folder um, to return to me on Friday. And after this, we will be moving into health. Okay, everybody, so we're in health. I wanna show you everybody's posters, but I'm terrible at this whole camera thing. Um, this one is so nice and colorful, I love it. There's one little problem with it. There's not a name on it. I don't know who it belongs to. Wilderness Safety, awesome pictures on here. Some people in the wilderness here. Um, never hike alone. Look at all those people they're hiking with. Awesome tip. Uh, always bring clean water even on short hikes and they have their water jug there. Get all the right gear, camping equipment. Do not start a fire by yourself. Awesome warning, warning, hunting season. Please wear blaze orange as a precaution. And you will see many hunters doing that. Very nice poster. Cooking safety and glittery letters. You know I love me some glitter. This is Caitlin Hanna's. Very cute chef here. Says keep the handles of pots turned away from the front of the stove. I have to remind myself to do that often, especially when I'm busy cooking a lot of food. I love that she actually used food things on her cooking safety poster. This is rice that she's colored green and blue, and that's a bow tie pasta. Cuteness, love it. Down here is Hunter's awesome poster. Hunter, I'm trying to show it all here. Bike safety. I'm probably making you guys seasick. I'm moving my camera so much. <coughs> Excuse me. Bike safety, very awesome tips that he got off of the internet. Very nice and neat, um, very organized poster. Safety first, for sure, for sure. Next one over here is another one, environmental safety from Owen. And he got some things off of the internet, pictures of lightning and tornadoes. And when thunder roars, go indoors great tip do not stay near or or in or near water we talked about several of those tips there in fact sunday night um easter night we had huge horrible storms in our area and um, lots of lightning and thunder i'm sure it woke many of you up this poster is fantastic wilderness safety carly did this poster um, excellent tips, leaves of three, let it be, um, woods and forest, oh, she has some yucky, yucky snakes on here, this one, oh my goodness, look, my finger's going in his mouth, he's biting me, um, very good pictures of poison oak, poison ivy, very good poster, Carly, this one is Lavinia's down here, and I'm going to keep moving my camera, um, fire safety. Am I there, guys? I'm sorry for all the moving around. Fire safety. She has some tips here. Um, a picture of a very large fire. If your house catches on fire, um, never go back into the house. 
huge tip. Even if you're trying to rescue something or get something out that's important to you, never go back in the house. If you catch on fire, number one, stop, drop, and roll. Do not run. Very, very excellent health posters. I'm going to put up a couple more for you so that you can see. All right, here's the last of our posters. This one is by Matthew Water Safety. Excellent pictures, <clears throat> nice coloring. Never push anyone near a pool. And a lot of times when we're swimming with our friends, we like just to be silly um, and do something like that. Don't do it, it's very dangerous. Get out of the water if you hear what? Thunder or sea lightning, so dangerous. Always swim with a buddy, never alone and wear a life jacket. I like that it says wear it, good rule. All right, um, down here, I'm gonna take this one off and lift it up. I think it's a little easier to see. Uh, this is also a no name, so I don't know who this belongs to. So please send me your name. Safety, keep poison away from children. Keep water away from wires. Um, if there's fire, stop, drop, and roll. Several safety tips on this poster. Make sure you send me your name for who this belongs to. Up here, we have one from Ella. Up at the top, safety. You need to be safe when you do certain things. Some can be more dangerous. Be safe when you are playing in the snow. Um, do not, um, sorry, I'm, I'm missing that one. Always tell people um, where you are going, very important. Do not swim when it is lightning outside. Several safety rules on that poster. And down here, let me turn that a little bit for you. We have one from Mari. Very creative, Mari. Actually, Mari, let me lift this up. Cooking safety. I like this one. Um, lots of cooking tips on here. And she put us some cupcake liners on as some decoration. Got us a cute fox here and a mouse cooking down here. Don't cook without supervision unless you have experience. And don't be afraid to ask questions. I like that tip. Make sure you wash your hands so you don't spread germs. Oh my, we are really talking about washing hands here lately. Um, clean station before moving to something else. Very good. There's a bunch of things there on knife safety. So important when working with knives. If you get a burn, cool it with running water. So many excellent tips on here. Good job, everybody, on your health posters. Today in health, your reading is on your syllabus, and I'm going to let you do that on your own. And you also have a quick checkup to do. Go ahead and do that in your book, please. And we will be doing how to eat fried worms next, and that will end your school day for today. This is a wilderness safety poster very awesome poster however there's not a name on it I just slipped all of these out of your folders at one time so um, I before I can give you a grade I need a name on it so if you are looking at this please send me a Jupiter message and let me know which one is yours if your name's not on it wilderness safety to do versus not to do I like that layout you want to bring plenty of water bring first aid wear proper clothing excellent Things not to do, don't go alone. Don't forget a compass. Don't forget a pocket knife. Very good on to do and not to do. This one down here, can you see it? Let me fix it a little bit. Um, this is Brianna's and I love her fire artwork. How cool, that looks so realistic. Um, this is a fire safety poster. Fire extinguisher helps put out flames. Here's several fire safety rules. And of course, stop, drop, and roll. This is a burning house, very sad. She said, apparently the people did not follow the rules. <laughs> and firefighters, they are our heroes. They help put out the fire. Excellent. Down here at the bottom, I'm gonna shift down, hopefully. This one's a little hard to see. This is Daniel's water safety. Never fight against a current is one of the rules that he has in the middle, which is so true. And he has a picture of what to do and not to do, of working with the current. Never dive in head first, very dangerous. Did you see Pastor dove in head first the other night on our Super Kids video? Uh oh, we're gonna have to tell him of our safety rule. <laughs> um, but you could hit something on your head. We read a very special story about someone who dove in first and was a quadriplegic for the rest of her life. Don't forget about that. Never 
swim alone or unsupervised. Very good tips, Daniel. And up here we have one, go up a little bit. Um, water safety, and there's not a name on this, so make sure and let me know if this is your poster. Don't leave baby alone in a tub, so important as a parent. Learn CPR, yes, um, definitely a good thing to know. Wear a life jacket, don't swim alone. And here's another one, very nice and colorful. I like this one, very nice and neat, but again, there's not a name on it. Um, always look out for falling trees, either in the city, on the highways, or in the forest. Did you know that beavers, people, woodpeckers, and termites all cut wood so these are things to be looking out for and this water safety poster i'm just going to take it off and put it up here for you this is addison's and she has water safety be safe she put some drops on um work with the current not against it don't swim alone very good pointers swim parallel to the shore rather than away from it we talked about that in health as well so excellent on these posters. Again, if you have one with no name, send me your name. I'm gonna put up a few more posters. And we are on chapter 32 of How to Eat Fried Worms. We're gonna finish up the book today. I hope you've been enjoying it. If you'll remember last time we read, Billy received a letter from Dr. Charles McGrath. It was actually for his mother telling him of all these problems that they have figured out if worms are eaten. And as I said, eh, I thought I saw some typos in that letter. So let's read along and see what happens. So chapter 32, and the name of this chapter is Croak. His hand trembling, Billy laid the peanut butter and fried worm sandwich down on the table. Do you think? Wow, whispered Tom. The screen door banged. Billy's father came into the kitchen. His tie loosened, his jacket slung over his arm. He laid his briefcase on the table. It's hot, he said. Billy staggered to the sink and feebly drew himself a glass of water. Tom and Emily watched, awestruck. What's the matter, asked Billy's father. Water dribbled down Billy's chin and onto his t-shirt as he drank. His mind swam. Poison? Paralysis? Tom, said Billy's father, what's going on? Tom pointed at the letter lying on the table. Billy's father read it, smiled, glanced at Billy, and got a Coke out of the refrigerator and sat down at the table. Well, he said to Billy, so it fooled you, huh? Fooled me, croaked Billy. I thought there was something tricky about that. Chapter 33, The 14th Worm. But how could Alan and Joe know all of those medical words, Mr. Forrester, said Tom. So Alan and Joe actually typed up that letter. Do you know what fulmar really means? Tom and Billy shook their heads. It means a bird, a seabird, I think. Boy, said Billy, disgusted. He sat back down at the table and picked up his sandwich. They could be arrested, Mr. Forrester, said Tom. Couldn't they be, couldn't they be arrested for defrauding the mail? Couldn't they... Billy grinned and sat down and bit on the peanut butter and fried worm sandwich. So in other words, he went right ahead and ate his 14th worm. And here we are, chapter 35, the 15th worm. Standing on a rusty pail, Billy peered through a crack into the horse barn. Joe was wandering about, lashing at cobwebs with a stick. Alan was slumped on a barrel, gnawing his thumbnail. Billy went around to the door. Hi, he said. Alan didn't look up. Hi, said Joe. Billy glanced around suspiciously. Take it easy, said Joe. We concede. At least I do. He is still trying to think up something. He pointed at Alan with a stick. Where's Tom, said Billy. He wouldn't eat his lunch, so his mother kept him in. That's how we started his book, this book. Billy leaned over the platter on the orange crate and smelled the steaming southern fried worm. He wanted to load it with red pepper, said Joe, but I wouldn't let him. Billy forked kept ketchup mustard onto the platter, cut a piece of worm, dipped it in the glop, stuck it in his mouth, chewed nervously, and swallowed. Cut another piece. The worm tasted better than usual. Sort of like kidney beans. Southern fried kidney beans. Where did you get this one? Down behind Bannerman, said Joe. From the muck, yelled Alan. The muck? Gooey, slimy, stagnant muck? Billy grinned. 
Yeah, you'll have to show me. This is the best one yet. Alan jumped up and kicked the barrel, clattering into a stall. Joe shrugged at Billy, grinning. Billy held up the last bite. Ta-da! And he swallowed it. Okay, let me look, said Alan. Come on. He peered into Billy's mouth. Oh no, come on. There's still some stuck between your teeth. Billy noisily got it out of his teeth. Okay, Alan's shoulders slumped. I can't get the money until tomorrow, he said. You know I'll have to work Saturdays for six months to pay it back. He trudged slowly toward the door. Coming, Joe? Yeah, maybe your father won't act so bad if I'm there when you tell him. Tomorrow, he said without turning. Ten o'clock. Yeah, sure, said Billy. Make it later if you want to. Nah, it's not going to do any good putting it off. Come on, Joe. Left alone in the barn, Billy hugged himself. This is our last chapter, I believe. No, I'm sorry, we're not on the last chapter. We're on chapter 35. I won, I won $50. He sat down on the crate grinning. I knew I could do it. I was so scared at first, waking everybody up in the middle of the night. He burped. Beans. I should have made it 30 worms and $100. That stupid letter. Joe knew when he was licked, though. He burped again. Beans. He stood up. How come that burp tasted like beans? He would had a hamburger for lunch and a glass of milk, then the worm. He snatched up the platter. Nothing left, just a few crumbs of cornmeal. Craning his neck, his eyes bugged out, straining, and he burped again. Beans! He burst out of the barn, stumbling over the sill, yelling. Across the field, Joe and Alan turned. Alan started running, and Joe grabbed his arm. It was a fake, panted Billy, coming up on them. You faked it. It wasn't a real worm. Real worm, said Joe. What are you talking about? You made a worm, yelled Billy, out of beans. Then tomorrow you were going to say I'd lost. I hadn't eaten 15 worms. The last one was fake. Oh, come on, will you, said Alan. He didn't do it when I was around, said Joe. You sure would you have for lunch? A hamburger and milk. Yeah, but where'd you get the hamburger? I don't know. My mother bought it. What difference does that make? Yeah, well, a lot of hamburger you get these days has stuff in it. You know, sausage meat, soybeans, bread crumbs. So the butcher makes more money. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, said Billy. Sure. But anyway, you come on back just to make sure I'm going to eat another worm. Suit yourself. Eat four more. Come on, Alan. Let, let him eat what he wants. The 15th worm. The real 15th worm. Billy threw back his head, lowered the worm. Alan charged around the door, leaped on Billy's back, flung him to the ground, punching, yelling, jumped up, grabbed Billy's feet, dragged him, bump, 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 across the rough, chaffy floor to the tool closet, bundled him inside, slammed the door, and locked it. Alan's getting very vicious here. Silence. Water trickling into the trough outside. Alan panting. What are you going to do with him, Joe asked hoarsely from the doorway. If he's in the closet, he can't eat the worm, can he? You're crazy. He'll start to yell. His parents will hear him. Yeah, yeah. Alan's hair was messed up. His shirt tail hung out. Yeah, said Joe, eyeing him. He will. He'll start to yell, and his parents will hear him. Alan glanced wildly about, starting toward the door. Turned. Not if we put him down the cistern. The cistern? Joe wiped his mouth. Alan, cut it out. It's only $50. A cistern is a well, in case you're wondering. Come on, face it. You've lost. You can't put Billy down in that cistern all by himself. Suppose there's water in it. It's 15 feet deep. We can lower him down with the rope. Bang, bang, bang. Billy was kicking the tool closet door. Let me out. Help, let me out. It's cheating. I want to get out. Bang, bang, bang. He kicked the door with both feet in time with his chant. Alan ran across the barn and grabbed hold of a beam, skipping to a stop began to kick aside the hay and trash which littered the planks over the old cistern. Bang, bang, I want to get out, I want to get out. Come on, Alan yelled at Joe, help me. We were all down in it last year. How's it going to hurt him? Come on, it'll work. I'll split it with you. Get some rope. I want to get out, yelled Billy. 
And now we are on chapter 37, out of the frying pan and into the oven. On his knees, yanking at the planks, which covered the old cistern, thinking, I've got him, I've got him, I win, he'll never. Alan felt a hand grip his shoulder. So they got him down in the, in the cistern. What the, I'm not going to read all this, is going on here, Mr. Forrester shouted down at him. Bang, 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 I want out. A confused babble of voices dying out suddenly. Now, said Mr. Forrester, Alan and Joe go home. Scoot. Alan and Joe crowded, crowded out the door. I've won, crowed Billy. He danced toward the platter. Nothing can. Billy, up to your room. I've got to eat this worm, Dad. I've, I've won. I've won. Billy, up to your room. Dad, I, his father pointed. Dad, if I don't eat what's left, I'll lose. Alan will win. It's just now. The bet is over. You know what I've told you about the cistern. Now. Dad, I'll lose. I'll lose. Then you will learn something. March. You mean I can't even eat that last little bit? How long could it take me? Billy, now. Oh my goodness, so Billy's dad's stepping in and he can't finish the last of the 15th worm. And I told you I was going to finish the book today, and we are, but I'm getting rained on. So I'm going to go in the house and finish up the book. So hang on just a minute and we will finish. All right, so I'm inside where it's not raining. And we're on the t heading towards the end of the book. We're on chapter 38. Billy kicked the bed. He'd won. All he had to do was eat two more bites. Just two more. He kicked the wall. Hadn't he, oh, I'm sorry. What his, why had his father gotten so mad? Alan had started opening, opening the cistern, not him, the cistern, not him. He hadn't even let him explain. Twice. Twice he'd won and then something had happened. And now he was going to lose after all he'd gone through nightmares, fights, thinking he'd been poisoned, all of that for nothing, he kicked the bed. Next chapter, the United States Calvary rides over the hilltop. That's the name of the chapter. Mrs. Forrester said Tom, peering through the screen door, could I see Billy for a minute? He's up in his room being punished, Tom. He and Joe and Alan were very naughty this afternoon. Yeah, said Tom, no kidding. What'd they do? Now we are on chapter 30. Nine, and I'm sorry, we're on chapter 40, the 15th worm. Billy kicked the wall again. Two minutes. What difference could two minutes have made? He leaned his forehead against the window pane, gazing dejectedly out into the backyard. That's what always happened. Somebody, Tom's younger brother Pete, suddenly appeared around the corner of the house, running, holding up a little yellow Easter basket. The worm! Tom, Pete had brought him a worm, the 15th worm. Billy slammed up the window. Catch, yelled Pete. Hurry, Tom's talking to your mother. He heaved a brick with a string tied to it up to Billy. Billy called, caught it and hauled the string up hand over hand. The basket came bobbing up the side of the house. Alan and Joe plunged out of the bushes. Billy snatched the tin can out of the Easter basket, plucked out a huge squirming night crawler. Mrs. Forrester, Mrs. Forrester, Alan and Joe shouted at the top of their lungs, dancing about on the lawn, waving their arms. Mrs. Forrester, too late, yelled Billy gleefully, throwing back his head. He dropped the squirming night crawler into his mouth, chewed and chewed. Tom and Mrs. Forrester appeared around the corner of the house. Too late, Billy yelled, still chewing. Too late, I win. He disappeared from the window. A door slammed inside the house, a trampling on the stairs. He burst on the kitchen door, a flying leap off the back steps. He rolled, scrambling up, yelling, I win, I win, grabbing Tom's hands. They danced around and around and around. Pete cavorting beside them. Joe and Alan slunk off through the bushes. Round and round and round they went. Billy's mother laughed and went into the kitchen, round and round and round, till they collapsed on their backs in the grass. I win, gasped Billy to the blue cloudless sky. I win. This last chapter is 41. 
Billy leaned the mini bike, he got his mini bike, against a tree and started down the path through the woods. Tom and Joe were already sitting by a smoldering trash fire on the riverbank, opening their lunch bags. Where's Alan? At the, um, at the store? asked Billy, flopping down by Joe. Yeah, said Joe. He's still got two weeks to go. What have you got for lunch? asked Tom. Billy looked embarrassed. Worm and egg on rye. Ew, said Tom. Why can't you ever bring something somebody else likes so you can trade? Billy frowned. He opened his lunch bag. I don't know. I just can't stop. I don't tear, don't, t oh, I'm sorry. I don't dare tell my mother. I even like the taste now. He scratched his head. Do you think there's something the doctors don't know? Do you think I could be the first person who's ever been hooked on worms? And that is the end of our story. So Billy is still eating worms and he's hooked on them. Oh my goodness, that's just yucky. I hope you enjoyed how to eat fried worms. Billy certainly enjoyed it because he got his mini bike. Um, we might choose another read along to do during this distance learning time. I will let you know. And that is the end of your school day today. I will see you tomorrow. Have a good afternoon. I'm gonna interrupt our next video to do some art. And um, so once this is over, we'll just go back to whatever I said we were actually going to do. But in your packet for this week, I put in two pieces of white paper, which you only need one. I just put in an extra in case you made a mistake. And I put you in a bag of salt and a bottle of glue. And if you had watercolors at school, I put those in also. But the very first thing that we're going to do is just draw a picture just with your glue. This is called, I don't even know what it's called. I just saw it on Pinterest and I thought it was pretty. So I'm gonna draw a picture of a water pot with my glue. If you want to sketch it with pencil first, you can, but you don't have to. And as always, art is optional. It's not something you have to do. Hi, I'm up here. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna make me a flower pot with glue. Hmm, this is not as easy as it looks. You might want to use a pencil. Then make me some grass here. And then, oh, don't get glue all over you. Then some stems. And add some flowers. some leaves see if I can make something that looks kind of like a rose um no but you know use your imagination with me hmm maybe a tulip in here I'm sure Caitlin Hannah's and Ella's will be much prettier than mine is and Lavinia's they're my wonderful artists So I'm just continuing to draw whatever I want with my glue. You don't want to use, use just a huge amount, but you want to make sure you have a nice thick line. So I'm making a couple of my, my lines a little bit thicker. And let's see, let's do another flower over here. Boy, my tulip is really pitiful looking. Let's try to fix it up a little bit. I don't know what kind of flower it is. It's something very interesting. And then I might put a couple extra flowers down here lower in the pot. And just make this a bunch of greenery over here be like Bob Ross. Let's just put a little happy tree over here. Happy trees. There's no mistakes, only happy trees. All right, so I'm going to decorate my flower pot too, I think. 
and put some wavy lines on my flower pot. Okay, so now I'm going to take my salt bag, oh, and you can either pour it out, or I thought I'd just cut this little corner and then pour it into my cup. Any old cup will work. And then I'm gonna completely cover all of my glue with my salt. And after you get that completely covered, you want to let it dry. And then I'll come back and show you what we're gonna do next. We're gonna paint it next. And I might not have enough salt here. Because I gave all my salt away to my sixth graders. I think I'm gonna have enough. Okay, and then you can make a really big mess. And you want to shake your extra salt off. That actually looks pretty cool. So then that salt's going to stick to your glue. And you're going to let that dry. I'm trying to get a picture of it. Going to let that dry. And then after it dries, I'm going to come back and paint it and it is going to be a Presson masterpiece. Okay, sixth grade, so my salt has dried and I've started some of the green paint. Also, my husband's on a conference call in the background, so if you hear anything, that's what it is. So I wanna talk kind of quietly. It's really cool when you actually paint this, you don't brush it on, you kind of dab it on because the salt just kind of sucks up your paint. So I think I'll do my pot at the, my flower pot next and I might do it all in blues so of course you want to get your watercolor really wet and as you can see it just kind of travels the salt helps the paint kind of travel and so you're not really brushing it you're more like dabbing it which is kind of neat because it leaves kind of this trail that makes it artsy without you having to really try. The more water you use, kind of the faster that it travels along your salt line. It did take a little while for the glue to dry. I actually even put mine outside, if that would help any of your but if it's raining, don't put it out, of course. But isn't that cool how the salt just kind of sucks up your paint and travels? Painting is therapeutic to a lot of people. You know what that means? That means it kind of relaxes you. Painting is definitely therapeutic to me. I just don't always like my finished product, but hey, you know. Let's see, let's use a little bit of a, let's put some yellow in my flower pot. There's so much blue in my brush, it might end up kind of green, which I don't want, but. Oh, that's good and yellow. And it just takes you right along your lines there. So if you take time to do some art, take a picture of it and send it to me. I'd love to see it. My phone number is 865-621-8443. Let's do a couple of these flowers up here. It just kind of soaks in and travels. So it's not like, you can't like get a just a perfect perfect line, but you really don't want it because the, the imperfectness, is that a word? Adds to the creativity. Also, I just posted, it's Monday for you, and I just posted some of your just posted some of your 
quarantine poems on Facebook and we're already getting a lot of likes on them. People are getting to see your creativity that I love about you. Add some orange here. I'm really, really feeling very Bob Ross-ish. This was supposed to be a tulip up here. It didn't turn out that way. We'll just call it, I don't know. Let's call it a tiger lily. Okay. Sometimes the salt is kind of getting in my paints, but I don't think it will hurt them because I'm just kind of dabbing. As I said, the more water you have on your brush, the faster your paint travels right. through that yeah, salt. Yeah, All right, we have to have All a right. pink flower on here because you know me, I'm a pink kind of girl. So some of you boys do me some, do some boy art for me. You don't have to do a flower pot. I don't know, do a race car. Do one of your Xbox guys. Can always do a sports ball or something. Get creative for me. I want to see them. Oh, well, this was supposed to be a rose, but you know, it didn't really turn out that way. Let's let it add a little bit of a darker hot pink to the edges. Maybe it'll. It is just so neat the way that paint travels through that salt. I love that. All right, I never did do the top of my flower pot, but it's starting to go up that direction just because um, the paint's traveling up through the salt. So let's see, let's do some orange on the very top of that flower pot. Anyways, it's kind of cool. It's fun. As I said, it's relaxing, therapeutic. During this quarantine time, we all need something a little relaxing. Art in the classroom. Y'all get so noisy. It's not always relaxing. <laughs> but maybe art at home will be a little relaxing for you. Maybe I'll stripe that kind of orangey there. Ooh, it's getting a little messy because it's mixing in with my blue paint and my green paint. I'll just paint that whole thing kind of orangish. And back up to finish a couple flowers here. Make this one sunny over here with a red center. Also, the more salt that you use on your glue line, like the thicker your glue line is, the better that the paint can kind of travel through that glue line as you dab it on. So if your glue line is very thin, I don't think it's going to work as well. You might want to kind of make it kind of thick and then dab your or sprinkle your salt on. Well, that one turned out pretty. I liked, liked the yellow one. Let's see, let me finish this flower over here. Um, I like the yellow so much, I'm actually gonna do more yellow over here. The yellow is sunshiny. So what do you guys think of my masterpiece? I think it's pretty awesome. And just a little more green. Uh, maybe a light green. Oh, messed that one up. Maybe a light green in on some of my leaves and stems here. All right, this is amazing. Van Gogh would be super duper proud of me. And ta-da! 
salt paint, glue, and it's a masterpiece. My mother will love it. <laughs> All moms love paintings. All right, so show me you guys, your, show me your pictures, text them to me, I wanna see them.